um, get started for our regular meeting for the City of Aiken Planning Commission for Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. If you have any phones, please uh, silence them at this time. Uh, I'm going to go over the guidelines for public commenting for the City of Aiken Planning Commission meetings. Meetings are public forums in which many opinions are expressed and the business of the city must be conducted. As such, discipline, honorable, and professional decorum is paramount. Courteous and respectful communication is required. During public comment periods of the meeting, all questions and statements from the public shall be directed to the chairman. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand and the chairman will recognize you. Please approach the podium and state your name and address. In order to allow an opportunity for everyone who wishes to address the commission, speakers should limit their comments to the agenda item or the application being discussed. Each speaker will be given five minutes to address an issue and may only address an issue once, once unless questions from the commission are posed to the speaker. We will be running a clock that you'll see on the sides back here when you're speaking. I'll give you a warning when you have a minute uh, to go. Thank you. Okay, we're going to enter into uh, item one, the approval of the minutes uh, from the last se uh, session on December 13th, 2022. Any comments or questions from commissioners? Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, we have a motion and a second discussion. All right, no discussion. Let's take a vote. All in favor, raise your hand. Like, sign, opposed. The motion passes unanimously. The minutes are approved. Okay, uh, item two, old business. There is uh, no old business, so we'll move into new business. Item three, this will be application A. Uh, this is application number 23-20010. This is an annexation request for tax parcel number 089-12-11-005. Uh, current zoning is residential single-family uh, conservation in the county, and the new proposed zoning will be a single-family residential. Uh, is the applicant here tonight to speak on behalf of this application? Okay. Do I have anybody uh, that opposes this application? Okay. Anybody in favor of this application? All right. Seeing none, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, in regards to application number 23-20010, annexation request, current zoning RZ, proposed zoning RS15, I make a motion that we move to City Council for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion for approval and a second. Discussion? Okay, no discussion. All in favor, raise your hand. Like, sign, opposed. Okay, and the motion passes unanimously. Okay, item B, this is application number 23-30004. This is a city services request for tax parcel number 123-20-03-004. The applicant is Cranston Engineering Group. Do I have somebody here, the applicant, to speak on behalf of this, please, sir? Yes. Well, good evening, my name is James Dean, address 452 Ellis Street, Augusta, Georgia. Um, as you can see on the screen, this, this development uh, situated on a shade under seven acres has three apartment buildings consisting of 74 units. Um, that's one and two bedroom units and then a small leasing office. Um, and we are asking the city to consider uh, extending the water and sanitary sewer services to this development. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the panel, from the commissioners for applicant? Okay. Do I have anybody to speak uh, in opposition to this application? Yes. I'm sorry, could you repeat your name again? Xavier Johnson. I live at 197 Dominion Lane, okay. Dominion Drive. I live like right behind here. I'm just trying to figure out, is this already in play? The apartments are already going to get built regardless of the request for the utilities or because I'm trying to figure out like, what's going on because nobody knows in the neighborhood what's going on. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so the city services, uh, the, the lines are there for them to tap onto. So I think they're going to be moving forward with the construction of these. Okay. So this being Aiken 
County or this being New Ellington? How would this is in Aiken County. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. All right. That's all I want to know. Cause if I had people asking questions. That's all. Um, they, after the meeting tonight, um, this will go in front of City Council. Mm -hmm. So I, I would, if you have further questions or concerns, uh, you can certainly attend this, the next City Council meeting, which this will be brought up. Okay. As well. And I might just add, just add as well, since this is in the county, then we'll mm -hmm. have to go through their review process as well, and I believe it has to go through county. Don't hold me to that, but I believe it has to go through Aiken County Planning Commission as well. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, it may ha have dual reviews. There's a couple of steps it has to go through before they can okay. start building. So I'll just ask how the traffic on Whiskey Road is terrible. Yes, sir. Especially in the morning of us trying to get out of our neighborhood, so having an apartment built right there is going to be even worse. That's why I understand. Um, they do have to submit a traffic study as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Right, anybody else in opposition to this application? All right. Do we have anybody in favor of this application? Okay. Seeing no hands, do I have a motion? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, in regards to application number 23-30004, city service request, tax partial number 123-20-03, Dash zero zero four. I move that we submit this to City Council along with the seven possible conditions. Okay, we have a motion. I have a second. I second it. Okay, we have a motion um, and seconding for the uh, approval of this application with the conditions one through seven as listed. Discussion. All right. All those in favor? Raise your hand. Okay, like sign opposed. Okay, and the motion passes unanimously. Okay, the last application on our new business tonight. This is application uh, <clears throat> number 23-23002. Uh, this is a concept plan approval request for tax parcel number 123-11-22-001. Now this is for a new Parker's gas station um, located over there the corner of Stratford and Whiskey Road. Uh, is the applicant here tonight uh, to speak on this application? Thank you. Just to remind you, give you five minutes to give us a brief summary. Sure. Okay. Um, I doubt it will take that long. Sure, understood. But, uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Um, I'm Daniel Ben Israel. I'm the real estate development manager for uh, the Drayton Parker Companies and Parker's Kitchens. Um, I'm here tonight with uh, um, our civil engineer and project manager, Cody Rogers with EMC Engineering, Thomas Matthews with Parkers, um, and uh, the property owner, Mr. Don, or the uh, real estate broker working with us, Don Sprawls is here as well. Um, we've provided you with renderings. I also have a materials board here representing uh, what the uh, end product will be once uh, it's built. If um, if we're able to get the rezoning approved and site plan approval subsequently there too. Um, tonight's uh, proposal that's before you is for a site plan to accommodate our standard uh, convenience store and fueling center consisting of a structure uh, that represents about 5,100 square feet um, and associated parking uh, with a single line uh, diesel uh, fuel, fuel canopy in the front of the store. Uh, we're proposing to have access out onto um, Whiskey Road and uh, Stratford. Um, the, I believe you discussed this during your work session as well. Um, we actually met with the residents of the Stratford um, Forest um, um, HOA last week. Um, uh, they expressed some concerns about traffic. Um, we're working through those concerns. We actually are undertaking a traffic impact analysis currently. Uh, which will be completed uh, very soon. We had a meeting just today with uh, the city's traffic consultant and our traffic engineer. We're also cooperating with the uh, developer's uh, traffic engineering and civil engineering team, uh, the developer across the street. So we'll be working with them over the upcoming weeks to coordinate around improvements to the intersection, signal coordinate, coordination, et cetera, um, to make this project um, work moving forward. Um, <clears throat> just by way of background, um, forgive me, 
I know we have one site that's currently working its way through the approval process already. We were here last year to get that property annexed and rezoned um, into the city. Uh, that property is at Jeff Davis and Bell Highway. So um, we're working on that site. We worked with staff and we came before the planning commission for that annexation and rezoning. And so we're here now with another site. Uh, we're looking forward to um, um, operating here in the city of Aiken. Um, just by way of background, we are currently operating 73 convenience stores in Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, we recently, within the past couple of years, decided to expand further um, into South Carolina, north and west. Um, and we're also expanding down into the Jacksonville, Florida market at this time as well. Uh, we have five stores under construction and we probably have in the pipeline another 20 to 40 stores that we're working on actively with the goal of uh, building 20 stores annually for the next five years. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking forward to making our um, presence here in Aiken a part of that expansion, uh, that corporate wide um, expansion. and. Um, it's been a delight to work with staff thus far, and we, we really appreciate your cooperation and consideration of our proposal. I'll be happy to answer any questions, or if any members of our team can answer any questions that you may have, um, um, I'll just uh, I'll be available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the commissioners for the applicant? Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, do I have anybody here to speak? in opposition of this application tonight. Oh, um, yes, ma'am, yes, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, please. Just wanna remind everybody the five limit, five minute limit. My name is Mary Agresta. I live on Ascot Drive in Springstone section. And very, very, very opposed to this convenience store slash gas station. They want to do a cut through on Stratford, which is a one way in and a one way out for all of the residents. And it's gonna be unbelievable. With all the pumps that they plan on doing, um, there's gonna be a lot of tractor trailers coming in and out. We are, we are gonna be suffocated by traffic. I don't care how much you do a traffic survey there's no way to know, unless the building is there and cars are going in and out and trucks are going in and out, that you're gonna know what the traffic's gonna be like there. Two tractor trailers would take up almost all of Stratford. How are we supposed to get out of our community? It's a quiet community. Um, it's gonna be loud. It's gonna be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have, I think it's eight pumps. Then they wanna put underground tanks Three that hold 20,000 gallons each on Stratford as well. God forbid there's a leak, we'll never get out. So I spoke to a few neighbors, they're all confused. They think, oh, okay, a little noise, a little smell, but I don't think they're really aware of the traffic, uh, the congestion. And with all the stores that he said that he has, there's no reason to put it there. There's no reason. And, str and like I said, you know, the traffic, the smell, the noise, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They already took down uh, a lot of trees. So that would be muffling. It's, it's not. And Lynn Drive is right there, and then Ascot, and then, I mean, it's just a lot of us are very concerned, and we do not want it. We do not want it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, you had. Hi, my name is uh, John Melvin, M-E-L-V-I-N. I live at uh, 136 Antietam Drive in Stratford Hall subdivision, at the end of uh, Stratford Drive. Um, when you said there was only, you can only get up to discuss one issue, is this the issue or is there individual things that are well, that might come up about this situation that I can talk about. Anything about this application that you wish to talk about? What you mentioned that single issue, you can't come back and talk about the same issue again, or is if, it? If you have some questions, we can. Okay, we can okay. So um, let me start on this first part. I worked out at uh, Savannah River site. 
uh, Department of Energy oversight uh, for the tank farms, and there was a project that was out at the, uh, the tank farms. It was called in-tank uh, processing, ITP. ITP was a study in uh, organic chemistry, which if anybody has any engineering background, is a, it's a moving target, depending on what the environment is. So we ended up with a material in the tanks that ended up generating benzene. We used to just have to deal with hydrogen, which you could vent and you'd make sure that you, know, you met the NFPA, fire protection for explosion. Benzene's a little different, it's a little heavier compound, and it's a carcinogen. So we we had to set up industrial hygiene all over that part of the tank farm to monitor it. It had to be put under a, a, a an inerting blanket and controlled very closely. So to get to my point on why I bring that up is I went in and I found a number of studies and documents with the uh, National Institute of Health and the CDC. And one of them is uh, benzene exposure for the carcinogens. It hits the, uh, the, the blood um, cell creating areas, leukemias, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And so what, what they finally concluded is that uh, some of this is from environmental impacts that we put on ourselves within our own communities gas stations. They've got venting pipes. They stick them up in the air, but the benzene's heavy, so there's a, when, they, when that floats out, it'll settle. You've also got the issues of whether or not from the tank leaks in in-ground tanks, you have groundwater affected by the benzene. And we've got, from our last uh, meetings we had for the development of Lulu's, the people living over on Sizemore Circle, they're, they're predominantly on well water. So that was a concern to them. But just to get to this, this point about the benzene, it's, it may sink into low-lying areas. It's a natural part of gasoline. It's uh, top 20 chemicals in production by volume. Um, so, so the air around your gas station can draw high levels of benzene and other areas. So what, what's happened from a number of studies is that they've, they've recognized that you've got about 10 times more impact than they previously had, had determined from the operations at, a, at a, a gas station. Some of them are when you're filling your tank, but when the tankers come in to fill the tanks, they displace the, uh, the, the air volume, push the fumes out the top, the benzene floats out. Our subdivisions are down gradient. You get a little bit of a temperature inversion, it's naturally gonna settle in those lower areas. I, it's, um, the, other, the other part of it is, is, is looking, you know, and I think we already have sensitivity of putting gas stations near residential areas, but the other one is, is when you do them in clusters. So the study they had on the benzene uh, impacts uh, from the gas stations and, and clusters was they were about uh, five times higher of impact than they were for a single gas station. The gas station was four lanes where you had eight filling stations. We've already got that at the Circle K. So, uh, uh, Sir, I, I just want to, I don't want to be I, rude, I, but. I, I, I just want to give everybody a chance to speak tonight. I understand. I so. understand. But I, like I say, this is just one of my issues. But I, I want I want that to be noted in your. Yes, sir. That uh, there's going to have to be some address of why we need to put that type of intensity of gas stations so close to residential areas. Yes, sir. Okay. I understand. Thank, Thank you. you for commenting tonight. Okay. Uh, do I have anybody else to speak? On, uh, yes, ma'am. This is speaking in opposition for this application. Hi, my name is Nicole Dre. I live at 119 Antietam Drive, um, and I am also the uh, Stratford Hall HOA president. Um, I have some great concerns about this. Uh, I work at the site. I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, um, I've had many a discussion with Cody about this. 
So um, the first thing, being from the site, safety and security is a big concern. It's ingrained in me. You're welcome. Um, so this light, we only have one entrance and exit coming into Stratford for the villas, for Springstone, um, for Stratford Hall. If there's any kind of event, whether a tanker comes down, an accident, an explosion, not that probably that won't happen, but anything that happens, we are stuck. All right, we cannot get out. So I know one proposal was that the road between Stratford and Sizemore would be connected so that we would have another exit, which is an acceptable option, but something you're gonna need to think about, eventually you're going to have to put a light at Sizemore, and contrary to what Cody may think, this whole, um, you can't put a light there, too many lights on whiskey, that's gone the way of the dodo. I'm sorry, if, you're, if this place is going to grow, if the city of Aiken is going to grow, you have to think about the infrastructure. I do not think the infrastructure is being thought about. This is why, because we have a Lulu's now, which was supposed to cut into uh, size more, and they're deciding to do something shady, and now they're only going to build part of the road and then connect to the Parker's Kitchen here instead of cutting out to size more. Um, we have that third lot next to uh, Lulu's. We have that really big lot behind those three lots. We have the senior center next to the hotel, which my understanding is they're looking, now I could be wrong, they're looking to cut into Stratford as well. And then let's take a look at the other side, Powderhouse Road. Have any of you driven on Powderhouse Road lately, in turn, when, especially at the peak time? All right. Circle K is a death trap trying to make a left out onto Powder House Road, and I've almost gotten hit many times. Now they want to put in, I believe it's called a Lowe's Kitchen or something like that. Now I don't know if you're planning on expanding Powder House to a four lane road or not, um, but the uh, traffic, Powder House Road is not designed to handle the traffic that you're planning to put on it. All right, it's going to turn into another dowdery, if not worse. And um, uh, again, and then you're going to have the tankers coming in, you're going to have the grocery trucks coming in. Um, it's just going to be a death trap. And so if you're not thinking about this infrastructure, you really do need to, because it's going to cost a $10,000 today, but it's going to cost a million dollars tomorrow. So you need to plan today for that infrastructure if you're going to put this stuff in there. Um, I've seen it before, I'm from Pennsylvania. They did it before, now it's costing 20 million, if not more, to expand the highway because they didn't think ahead. So I do have a question, you can answer it now or later, something to think about. What is the expected growth of, in of Aiken in the next five years, 10 years, 15, 20? I'm sure you all have a number. You, this infrastructure needs to be prepared. So if they are going to, because I know that was something they were talking about, connecting, Stratford and Sizemore, a light at Sizemore should be considered because again, as I said, if it's 10,000 today, it's going to be a million dollars tomorrow to do it. Um, and um, about the survey, I'd like to know how many times uh, a week they're doing the survey at this traffic stop. Have they considered all of the items I've mentioned, Parker's Kitchen, Lulu's, that third and fourth lot, the senior center, Parker, the, the grocery store, and all the other stuff at that, if they considered all of that, you can't just say Parker's. You have to include everything and anticipate the future. What is going to be at these other lots? Um, and the other time is what time of days? Because it's one thing to do it on paper, but as my colleague, my civil engineer colleague, um, and I know what looks good on paper is not necessarily good in reality. Uh, and um, thank you, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, my name is Kelly Cornelius. My address is 160 Lynn Drive, which is right off of Stratford, which is adjacent to the entire parcel. And I think Nicole's right when she tells you, you have to look at this as an entire parcel because you dropped the current or the 
passed zoning on this, which included um, restrictions for car washes, Lulu's, 24-hour uh, um, establishments, which I'm guessing that this will be, but I haven't read that or not. So when those were dropped, when Lulu's was approved, that was done as an entire parcel. So um, I think we have to look at everything that's going in here, not just this, um, because that's the way you changed the zoning on it. And we will argue that that zoning was still in existence as part of the PC zoning. It was PC with conditions, but um, I believe you and the city council were led to believe that that went away when the concept plan went away. Um, so that's a point of contention. I think most people thought when they bought in there that those conditions would be upheld and that they wouldn't have things like this uh, in their backyards. So uh, if you haven't watched those meetings, if you weren't a part of the planning commission then, if you weren't um, paying attention to city council then, I would recommend that you review uh, everything that the citizens brought forth during those meetings um, before Lulu's was approved. So uh, that being said, my concerns with this are safety concerns. This is a residential road. It's the only way in and out, as other people have explained to you. Um, environmental concerns, um, this is fuel. Uh, what environmental studies have been done? Uh, what traffic studies have been done? Uh, I don't know how you could vote on this with the information that we were provided uh, this evening. And then my next question is, I'm looking at your agenda, and there's an agenda for a work session. When I looked on your website, um, it said that there was a six o'clock meeting for this. Uh, there was no, nothing on your website that said a work session. So was this issue discussed at a work session earlier this evening? The work session uh, is at 5 o'clock, and it just allows the commissioners to review the and understand the application that's going to be talked about in but public. But wouldn't that be uh, allowing your citizens to review that as well? Shouldn't that You're be welcome to come to those posted work sessions. As, as well? Because I think there's a question with due process on what's being presented um, in general, this is due, this is this is due process. Your due process that you speak. So, don't you right? think we should have been able to have that? Was there a presentation by developers? No, at five? no, no, ma'am. So, what came before you at five that we missed by not being here at five? The, the same information you see right now is the same information we saw at five o'clock. Also, our all of our work sessions are also public record. They're they're in our minutes as well. Okay, so that why wouldn't have that been on the the website when I looked about this meeting? It just said six o'clock. Um, All planning commissions have work sessions at five o'clock. The public is welcome. They're welcome to attend. There's no decisions that are made in that work session. We talk about the application at hand. We want to understand it. Uh, and then we come in here at a public hearing for everybody to have due process to speak to it. I, th I think we would have liked to attend that had we known, so I would recommend you put It's not a public input session. I will tell you that. The work, the work session is not a public input session. Okay, so we don't take comments from the public there. You're welcome to be there to, to listen to what, we, to what we discuss, but we do not take public comment during the work session. This is the meeting for public comment, which you are speaking okay. to now. So the due process is followed, um, which, which is what the city ordinance requires us to do. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else to speak in opposition? Yes, ma'am, in the back back there. Hello, my name is Jean Greenwald, and I live at 160 Lynn Drive also. And then, yes, it's in my backyard, and that's why I'm here. Just this morning, I paid my city taxes, and I thought, boy, maybe I better go to the meeting tonight to speak up to let them know how I feel about my little concept and yours. I can't believe our commissioners would approve any such concept. I lived in a beautiful city in Sarasota, Florida for over 40 years, and I can tell you I saw what the developers did to the city. It was beautiful like this city in the beginning, and after 40 years, it was all commercial. It was all about money. Yes, let's, let's build this, let's build that. Do we really need all that to keep our city as unique as it is? 
I agree with everybody that's come up here to speak tonight, and I hope you commissioners would listen to them and take some of our advice. So thank you for listening, and thank you for going in the right direction, we hope. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Bill Reichart, and I live on Steeple Ridge Road, 133, which is also part of the residential areas that we're talking about. I did not come tonight prepared to make remarks, but had I, many of them have already been covered and we're concerned all the way from density. And I think one thing that has not been mentioned tonight is a new high density senior housing project that's gonna go in near Holiday Inn, which will have a cut onto Stat Stratford Drive. That's another 350 approximate units with commensurate population and cars that also will be dumping in to Stratford Drive. And we live uh, as some of these other people. And incidentally, if the folks who have spoken in opposition had other comments, if we could meet for just a minute after this, it would be helpful. Um, that's gonna probably itself double the traffic on Stratford. When you put gas tankers on, I don't even know if the road is strong enough to support gas tankers, and all the additional uh, traffic from the gas station and Lulu's, it's just become a jammed up nightmare, uh, the equivalent of uh, DVT. Um, also in some of these subject areas, I think there's a higher rate than the general population of elderly people. A lot of these people are intending as my wife and I and some others, this is where we're gonna live till we die. And some of us, uh, you know, have considerations that uh, cause us to be interested in the equity in our homes and not see it go away. Um, I have myself, with some help from some neighbors, written a position paper on this that will kind of summarize a lot of what we've been talking about and we'll refine it with our colleagues here, but we feel quite strongly that pragmatic information, oh, oh, and incidentally, there was a major traffic accident just last Friday afternoon at this intersection. There were at least three or four cars uh, badly mangled with ambulances and tow trucks showing up. Um, so anyway, we, we feel this would be a disaster and a gas station is not needed at that corner at all, nor does another cut have to be made into Stratford at all. Plus, the gas station, if it has to exist, can be moved down Whiskey Avenue to far less populated areas and they'll still pick up their traffic. This intersection that we're talking about is not amenable to this development. The one up at, um, the parkway near uh, Sam's Club and so forth has been mentioned. That's far more suited to a Parker's Kitchen than our area, and it will have a great impact on our quality of life, but we'll get back to you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. My name's Dick Salsitz. I live at 130 Steeple Ridge Road. I've been a realtor in Aiken for about 22 years. I've lived in Springstone almost 20 years. And uh, the impact this is going to have on the real estate properties that are existing in the three communities we're talking about is going to be in the negative. And that needs to be taken into consideration. As Bill said, uh, there are a lot of people that are of elderly age. They cannot just pick up and move because of this problem, and this is their final destination. That needs to be taken into consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Diane Solsitz. I live at 130 Steeple Ridge Road. I read, done a lot of research, and there's an awful lot of things that happen to the environmental. It, cancer causing, and we've had several cases of cancer 
It's affected people, dogs, animals, and these are things that need to be taken into consideration also. The people who live in the villas of an evening go out and have a glass of wine, a glass of tea, watch their bird, bird houses, their bird baths. Now they're going to be looking at this Parker's kitchen. It's lit up, and I'm sure it's a nice building. I've never seen one, but the conception there. And they've got the noise, you've got the laughing, you've got all this. This is their home. And it's, they can't sell it and get what they put in it out. I mean, that's been, I've seen that on the research I've done. I've also seen what it does to the environmental. It goes to the soil, it goes to, into the air, into the water, size more circle, they're on wells. And if some of you could just research that I, I've got it at home. It's not doing me any good here, but I do have it. And it's important that these things be taken into consideration. I'm a cancer survivor, as was six others who lived in our neighborhood. We had a dog and a cat to die with cancer, okay? The cat was feral, so she lived here for two years. Our dog came with us, and he was diagnosed nine months before I was. There's only two things that the dog and I did. We breathed the same air and we drank the same water. We definitely didn't share food. Maybe a snack here and there, but you know, other than that, <laughs> that's about it. But it is something that needs to be taken into consideration. We have small children living there. Other people have lost their animals to cancer and it's been proven that these things affect animals before they affect us because the animal is smaller. So if you could just take that into consideration, please, that and the lives of the people that live there that could be in jeopardy and trying to get out, that would be very appreciative. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, let me, let me make sure that everybody else gets a chance to speak that wants to speak. Um, yes, in the purple, uh, she raised her hand first. I'm Nancy Martin, and I live at 112 Sessions Drive, and I happened to come along when the accident happened on Friday afternoon. I tried to get in my subdivision, couldn't even get in. Um, there was an ambulance stopped at the end of the Stratford Hall, already turned in there, no police, three, at least three cars um, right there. The, the ENTs were attended to some of them. Traffic was backed up both directions. Um, I tr was able to, some cars were able to go toward New Ellington. I turned, was able to try to turn into um, Stratford Drive, but where the ambulance was and the car that was trying to come out, even with the wreck there, I couldn't get the right angle to turn to go in. So here I am halfway out in the lane, and all of a sudden the light um, is, Ch signal changed and a car came across right in front of the wreck from Powder House and just barreled across there and went on down Stratford Drive. But they stopped and had me back up so I'd get out of their way. So people go crazy when this kind of stuff happens. Um, I know some people who have had accidents there. But um, at the same time, you might find this interesting, we had a medical emergency in Stratford Hall. One of the um, residents was, uh, I'm assuming she was transported, but the ambulance was called for her. So I don't know if that ambulance was hers or just stopped early, but there were no police when I was there. And I did get to finally turn in when the lane was clear, but it was just such a, uh, it was a mess. And that was just, it was late, well, maybe four o'clock, 4.30, somewhere. Okay, I knew it was about that time. So, anyway, I just wanted to reiterate what he said because it upset me really badly to, after I found out one of my neighbors had to be transported and all that was going on. One way in, one way out, no room for any more. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I've been here a long time. Um, late 90s, my husband was very active in the homeowners he was on the board of directors and all that he's no longer with us 
but we worked hard back there to get things where we have them. <laughs> so please keep that in mind for all of us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Please, thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathy Kent. I live at 237 Sessions Drive. And I've listened to all of the comments so far. And I, I'm not going to repeat them because I think they've been explained very well. It could be a very dangerous situation having Parker's at that corner with the increased traffic and so forth. But I'm going to ask you all to think about your own situation and how you would feel if there was a large business 24 hours a day, seven days a week that was in your backyard that took the chance of more accidents, more ambulances not being able to get into your neighborhood as it's been stated several times, there's only one way in and one way out. And to have that extra traffic, we've lived with, with Circle K across the street, and any morning that you go there, everything is full. There are trucks there getting their morning coffee, filling up with gas. It is very congested, and we really don't want the same thing for Stratford Drive. Thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, do I have anybody else in opposition? You're in opposition? No, I'm not in opposition. Uh, I, I'm going to give you an opportunity to react. Okay, yes, sir, in the back there. My name is uh, Anthony Agresta. We live at 400 Ascot Drive in Springstone. Uh, and uh, like the person before me, I'm also not going to repeat all the other um, comments that other people have made. I don't want to waste your time. But I do want to talk about two other issues that I don't, uh, haven't heard anybody speak about yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one, um, are we allowed to ask questions of the applicant or? Well, if you'll address your questions to the panel, we'll so, let um, him. I'm curious what, uh, their daily sales volume of gasoline is anticipated of being. Um, reason being, you know, a tanker holds 8,500 gallons typically, uh, unless they've changed that um, in the many years since I worked at a gas station. And I'm trying to extrapolate and figure out how many tankers a day uh, you know, a, a traffic study is fine in terms of cars, but I'm curious as to how many tankers a day uh, are, are expected to go in and out. Um, you know, we moved here about two and a half years ago uh, from New Jersey looking for, uh, you know, a, a, a small town feel, you know, and maybe it's our fault we didn't do enough research and, and kind of figure out how much Aiken has grown over time. But to say that the amount of growth that Aiken has gone through in two and a half years is shocking, that would be an understatement. Um, the second issue uh, that I, I want to address uh, relates to infrastructure. Um, you know, we belong to a program run by uh, Aiken Electric uh, Co-op called uh, Beat the Heat, I think it's called where you get a text message when they're short of power asking you to conserve. Now, between the Lowe's Foods and uh, this project and possibly the uh, senior housing um, uh, behind the uh, Holiday Inn, uh, we're going to be faced with frequent blackouts. They can't just snap their fingers and say, here's another 100 kilowatts. You know, I mean, they don't have the infrastructure to provide more power. You know, so how is that going to be addressed? Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay, anybody else? Okay, sir, if you want to have another minute for another 
comment, question that hasn't already been discussed? Well, I'm going to say that I, I didn't know I was limited to which issue. I thought it was my first issue. But this is a, a John Melvin, 136 Antietam, Stratford Hall subdivision. Uh, the, the accident they were talking about, the accident, leave, the ambulance leaving our neighborhood had to go through the intersection, go through the parking lot at Circle K to head down Whiskey. The husband followed the ambulance. Traffic was from our intersection all the way to back to Mitchell Shopping Center, just to give you a sense. We talked about this when we had to sit down with, the, uh, with Parkers and the realtor to explain just how bad that intersection is. This is, on, this is above the pale. Um, so some of the issues that I, I would like to, to address with you, we've got the two and a half that Parker wants to use. There's another 5.3 at the top. Lulu's managed to split that property up into two two and a halves and a 5.3 which I believe was used to, to sidetrack the storm water. This last rain we had, which was almost three inches of water that came down on a short order, flooded Lulu's area that they're working on. If they pave it and they pave Parker, that 5.3, we said it last time when Lulu's got it, ought to be retained as a green area and a retention pond. And the gas station, if you guys don't respond to the benzene issue, you surely ought to be looking at dikes and, 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 that, and the uh, uh, retention pond for anything that might happen in that fueling operation. Getting more fuel trucks, all the deliveries for them, they're going to have the same type of industrial loads going through their gas station that Circle K does. We've got large contractor trailers coming through over there. It's a nightmare. Uh, what I would ask you guys to consider we went through this very same thing way back in 2003 and 2012. 2003, the property was bought on the right-hand side of Stratford going out, where we now have that piece that's going up for Parkers and Lulu's. Uh, the, the, the property developer, Mr. Waters, went and had it zoned for single-family adjoined and to have commercial up on the front from limited professional. When it went through the zoning board, the planning board, and the city council, there was no attempt to try to tell them exactly how that property was going to be done because it was going to be marketed. He didn't impl plan to, to develop it. But through all of those, and I would, I would ask you to please go back you can follow the, 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 the track back, but July 14, 2003, City Council put six restrictions on PC for being butted up to residential. And those six included no gas stations, no wa uh, uh, car washes, no uh, liquor stores, no clubs, uh, no fast food. But you can see the list. And, and how they got to that conclusion I would ask you to, to seriously consider. The other one is October 8th, 2012, where the hotel for the Holiday Inn Express was kept from coming on to, on to uh, Stratford Drive. We, we had city council members, they weren't even representing us, came to planning board meetings, zoning board meetings, so they understood by the time it got to them what it meant to the community. And, and, and we had it vanish in a heartbeat by fiat without any explanation of why suddenly restrictions on com competing zoning would have evaporated. And, and all the stuff about the traffic studies, it's all in there. We've still got a piece of property behind the hotel and the seniors that's still there. We've got an opportunity with the new subdivision, the new Lowe's, to put another intersection there. Sizemore Circle is a state-maintained road. And coming from Citadel, there's a power easement that goes straight through. I told the mayor and I told our representative they need to act with the state and the county to go and make a, a, a through cut to that. It's as close to a frontage road that we'll ever get. We should have had that on, on Whiskey to begin with. 
I've got other things to say, but if you can't act on this, I, I, I don't know what else I can say. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you speaking Thank you. tonight. Thank you. Okay, I want to give um, – is there anybody else to speak opposed to this on, on any issues that haven't been expressed so far? Okay. I want to give the applicant uh, an opportunity to – speak on some of these questions that were raised hey good afternoon cody rogers emc engineering and the civil engineer for parkers on this project uh, first thing i want to address that several residents brought up was that currently there is only one entry and exit point for stratford that's true uh, what we are proposing is actually to build at least a second access point by connecting with our stratford cut uh, you'll now have a, a second entrance back out onto whiskey if we were to go over to Sizemore as well, that would actually give three access points. So significantly increase the circulation in that area. Are you are you going to Sizemore? Is that what you're saying? That was not in our current plan, but when we met last Thursday, uh, that was one of the things that we got positive feedback from the community on. So it's certainly something that we're analyzing and talking about internally. Okay. <clears throat> the other, I, I wanted to expound on what Daniel said about the TIA meeting this morning, or traffic impact analysis meeting this morning. The traffic impact analysis for the lows across the street is already complete, and we're actually due to receive that report for our engineers to review it internally tomorrow. Uh, a couple things that I know did come out of that is a northbound turn lane on Whiskey onto Powderhouse. Uh, th that's what their report showed. It also, or I know there are in the works a redesign of that intersection for powder house a realignment of powder house it's so conceptual right now that we don't know if that's going to affect the stratford side or not uh, there are a multitude of options traffic wise traffic improvements that we talked about with the community last week everything from a right turn from whiskey on the stratford a left turn from stratford onto our proposed access road a multi multitude of different ideas of how to improve the signal timing, but all that will be worked out in the TIA that we're conducting right now because obviously we don't want to go in blind, just make recommendations. We want to see what that report recommends. Uh, there are planned significant improvements coming to that intersection, though. So just wanted to reiterate that we are going to work with that. Uh, um, the other thing we wanted to broach was uh, delivery trucks and, and any tankers. tankers. Tankers, that's right. So on average, we have about two tankers per week that come through. They spend about 20 to 30 minutes on site each time, and they're always off peak hour deliveries um, because nobody wants a, de a tanker delivery during a peak hour. Um, the only other trucks that would be coming into that site would be food delivery trucks, stocking trucks. You may have on average about five per week, but they're typically box trucks, not tractor mm. trailers, and would not cause significant delays or, or uh, conflicts. Are, are you 24 hours, your operation is 24 hours a day? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what, what do you use to calculate the two tankers per week for that location? So I can, I can speak to that. Please, okay. thank you. Uh, Daniel Benisfell, real estate development manager. Um, so we have three tanks on site, uh, three underground storage tanks on site, each having a capacity of 20,000 uh, gallons. Um, so we have 60,000 gallons of capacity on site, uh, 30,000 gallons of uh, unleaded fuel on site. And so on average, we'll have two. Um, and during peak season or peak uh, flow times, we'll have two to three deliveries of fuel per week um, of those trucks. And so we're selling in our pro forma, we're proje uh, projecting that this site will um, uh, sell approximately um, 200 to 240,000 gallons of fuel uh, per month. Okay. And so when you extract, when you do the math, that amounts to two to three truck deliveries a week, given the capacity that we have on site. Great. And when um, uh, we say non-peak hours, what, what typically are you uh, referring to? Like, when, when do these trucks would typically come? At what time? So um, it ranges, and so we have obviously having 73 locations we have trucks delivering at all times of day um, but i mean those trucks can be here at eight nine at night ten o'clock at night uh six o'clock in the morning um you know nine o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. three o'clock in the afternoon um but there's no telling but we're talking about one truck maximum 60 feet long 
that comes through, the maximum impact to traffic for that one truck to make its turn into our site is probably five seconds in reality. They get on site, they position themselves to, to fill the fuel tanks, and they're on site for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one truck. It's not a fuel stop, it's a truck stop. We don't have offer high flow diesel at this location, so we're not dealing with a constant flow of tractor trailers. So it, it's only for um, well, residential or commercial vehicles, residential is what I'm gonna call them, but not big trucks, 18 wheelers. That's correct, yeah, yeah. There's no service for um, high flow diesel at this location. Can, can you talk briefly um, the, on the environmental side of things as far as the uh, underground tanks, as far as your construction? Obviously, you have to have, um, you know, uh, inspections for the installation. Can you speak to that? Um, I, I can't speak to the scientific benzene and, and, and what have you that they're speaking of. I'm not a scientist. But um, I, I do know with underground fuel tanks, there's got to be some sort of process. Can you briefly talk about that? Sure, sure. So I'm, I'm not a chemical engineer, but I do uh, manage the permitting process for our underground storage tanks. Um, and so um, here in South Carolina, we're required to submit an application, a permit um, to install application. First off, let me back up. We have our fuel system uh, design. We, we um, engage the services of currently HFA engineering to help us with our fuel system designs for all of our locations. And so they're doing our, um, helping us with our tank layout, tank location and positioning, fuel piping, um, et cetera. Uh, we take those plans and we submit those plans to SCDHEC for, for plan review, or we need to submit to them a permit to install application, which is a pretty exhaustive application. I think it's about a 10 page document that provides details on all of the uh, tanks, the piping, um, products um, um, that we uh, install on our site. Um, right now we're employing the highest uh, level of technology on our sites, double wall um, fiberglass tanks. Um, we have um, sensors, sumps, spill buckets, you name it. The, the best technology we employ on our sites to prevent um, some of the issues that were presented earlier. Uh, we monitor our fuel levels in those tanks on a daily basis and we have to submit reports to DHEC on a monthly basis um, based on the inspections that are, that, that, um, are required on a monthly basis to maintain operation, operations of those tanks. Um, once we get our permits to install, um, those are issued. When it comes time to install those tanks, DHEC is present when we put the tanks in the ground. Um, in some, and in some cases, the local um, fire departments are, are um, in attendance as well. When those tanks go into the ground, um, they're, they're there to observe uh, the installation. Um, once those tanks um, are installed, and the sump systems are attached, and the fueling is comp uh, the piping is completed. DHEC is back on site for what we call a phase two inspection. Uh, once the um, the um, uh, the uh, multiple um, uh, product dispensers or um, pumps, if you will, are installed, and just prior to opening, we have to have yet a third inspection. We have a third inspection from DHEC. We have to hire a third party inspector. Um, to come and inspect the way that we've um, connected the system, installed the system. Um, they test the pressures in the tank, the pressure in the tank, and then we fill the tanks um, with water prior to actually filling them with fuel to ensure that there aren't any leaks and to ballast the, ta ballast the tanks, of course. But once that's completed, we have to submit those reports um, that we've provided and the third party inspector has provided. Those reports go back to DHEC for review before they issue a permit to operate the fuel system. And then thereafter, as I mentioned earlier, we have the monthly inspections and the daily monitoring that occurs in each of our sites. Okay, thank you. Got a question, how many years have you guys been in operation? Uh, the company was founded in 1976 um, by Gregory Parker, uh, who is still the current CEO, owner, um, and operator of the, of the company. Um, the first store was established in Midway, Georgia, um, where st on its original location, it's still in operation right now, store number one. Um, and um, yeah, we're continuing to grow and expand. So the company's been in, in operation for 47 years. 
any during other time any issues with benzene leaks or the technology you're, you're going to be installing for this new site any issues in other places that you've had to address or go to a rebuild or anything so we've had um and i can't speak to that entirely i've only i've been with the company for just shy of four years but i, I can tell you that uh we often purchase either existing c stores or um uh, C stores that were at once one at one point in operation, um, and on those properties we have some cases where we have to go in and remove fuel tanks, or the fuel tanks were removed prior to us either leasing or purchasing purchasing the property. When we do on um, that, we actually go in and we have to conduct um, environmental assessments. We do a phase one environmental assessment, and then in most cases where where there are known to be potential con contaminants, we actually do what we call a phase two, limited site investigation. And in many cases, um, those site investigations will uncover um, uh, what's called volatile compounds. And we have had instances where um, benzene was detected in the soils. Um, there is a process by which we would, uh, through which we would have to go to mitigate that, that um, contamination. We're working on a site right now in Merle's Inlet where our limited site investigation did uncover that benzene was present along with some other um, volatile compounds um, in some cases at un what what DHEC would classify as either unreportable levels or levels um, that are of lower concern than at other times and in those cases um, we come up with what we call a mitigation plan or um, we enter into a voluntary cleanup contract with DHEC and we have a what we call a media management plan that prescribes the method by which we have to go into those properties uh, and clean those properties up. So it does happen. I wish I could stand here and say that, oh yeah, our technology is such that um, it's um, impossible or um, uh, there's 100% chance that there will never be um, a leak or um, a spill from some, even from someone filling their, their uh, filling their fuel tank but I, I can't say that because um, the technology is man-made and um, we make mistakes and things fail and uh, it does happen um, but thankfully there's a process in place we have a very rigorous in-house inspection process and management process that um, uh, accompanied by the processes through which we have to go to obtain our permits and inspections at the state and local level helps us to ensure that we operate our locations in a safe manner. Thank you. I have a Sorry, I have a question. Sure. Earlier you mentioned double wall tanks. Mm -hmm. In the event, God forbid anything happens, if that inner wall tank had a leak, I'm assuming it'll spill over to the outer tank. Mm -hmm. So you said something about sensors? That's right. So where would that be detected? At the store or at a local office, a remote office somewhere else? So we're monitoring that in the store. We actually have uh, what we call a Vita root system. That's some of the technology that we employ on our site. And in that system, um, you can go and run reports. Um, and it's actually, you can, it's very visible. You can look at it and see what, where the tank levels are um, on an hourly basis, daily basis. Those reports are generated and we have to actually submit uh, those reports to DHEC on a monthly basis. Um, so it's detected at the store level, but we do also monitor it at the corporate level as well. So it's like a, would an alarm go off in the store if they had a leak, or would that be uh, some kind of piece of paper that they would have to read? The, the, so, so, so um, I, and again, I have limited knowledge, but I've, I've worked on the construction side, so I've seen, okay. I've seen some of this technology firsthand. And so um, there, it's color-coded. On the Vita Root system, if there is an issue, um, there's a red light that flashes. You know, uh, typically it's it's green if all systems are working properly. But if there is an issue, there's a you know a red light, yellow a caution light, and then um, you can look at the uh, detection levels or the um, fuel levels in the tanks themselves. And then um, again, those sensors will go off and trigger the system to indicate to you that there could be a problem. And once that happens, we get inspectors on site, we get our um, fuel team back at the corporate office involved and um, try to address the issues. We have contracts with companies such as Guardian Fuel Technologies that um, takes care of all of the maintenance 
on most of our facilities. We work with Guardian, we work with um, Central Industries, and um, Spatco is another that we work with very closely to do our installs and um, um, periodic uh, maintenance on our systems. Okay. I have one other question. I heard, I think, Cody, is it? You said earlier that you always working on some plans for improving that intersection with, and who are you working on those plans with? So we're not quite working on the plans just yet, but we're actually working on the preliminary investigation that will drive the plans. Uh, they, we're working with uh, SEI, Southeast Engineering, who is our traffic consultant. We're working with Kenley Horn, who is the traffic consultant for the uh, development across the street. And then we're working with Beal Engineering, Jennifer Beal, who is the city's traffic consultant. And what about DOT? Would they be included in those? They will be included as part of that study. All right. Anybody? Any questions on for the applicant? Um, if you gentlemen will sit down, um, we'll listen to a few more. My name is uh, Charles Mastromonico, and I live at 309 Sessions Drive in Stratford Hall. <clears throat> I've worked for Savannah River Site for 40 years as a chemical engineer, and that brings me to my first point. Uh, if you've ever been to Savannah River Site, you can see where it's built. It's out in the middle of nowhere because of the potential release of radioactive or chemical uh, poisons. It's not located next to residential areas because if there is a release, and as our representative from Parker said, there's always the potential for a release. When you get a gaseous release and there's some houses right next to you, it's already too late to stop the exposure. If you have distance, that's what dilutes the exposure, okay? Distance is one of the, the main objectives of the way the Savannah River site was built. <clears throat> My second issue has to do with the traffic. I, I attended the meeting that they held over um, at the uh, putt-putt uh, about a week ago, and <clears throat> they were talking about the traffic control was being monitored by some outfit in Kansas City, and that all they do is monitor how many cars go this way, how many cars go that way. So there's no information on how fast they're going, uh, you know, it's just when, when, and, and how many go through that, those, those intersections. That one intersection at Powder House, Stratford Hall, and Whiskey Road, I don't know if you live on the south side of town, but starting at about maybe 4 o'clock or even earlier because of the high schools letting out all the way on through 6 o'clock, it's a wall of traffic there with a bunch of mad people, and they're either driving zero or they're driving 55, and there is no monitoring. There, there's no traffic control there whatsoever. I, I rarely see a police car there unless an accident has occurred, and many do occur on that strip of road. So when, when you start thinking about all the stuff that's being added in there, there's, there's housing being developed right now on Powder House Road that hasn't been completed yet. There's going to be a big grocery store there. They've just finished that Danbrook Village. So we're now going to have a Lulu's and then another gas station. So, you know, where are you getting your data as far as traffic study from, the, from that outfit in Kansas City, that's not going to do you any good at all. Anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Bill Wright.
Leichhardt on Steeple Ridge Road. This gentleman just made the point that I was going to about um, some of these traffic light issues and the monitor being in Kansas City. Uh, that's a very remote way of knowing what's going on. I would like to invite you folks. Uh, I, I assume you're all familiar with Whiskey Road at the Powder House intersection, so forth and so on. Powder House coming into Whiskey Road. You might not have noticed very much Stratford Drive, which of course goes behind the Holiday Inn. I'm just inviting you folks to some day, some weekday at 4.30 or 5, just come on down there and see what the current traffic situation is because it's quite severe and it's safe to assume that anything that happens in addition to that will only exacerbate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Do you have some questions for the uh, something that we haven't talked about yet? Okay. Okay. I want to give everybody an opportunity to speak and, and voice your concern, but if it's been spoken to, I'd like to try to. Mary Agresta, 400 Ascot Drive in Stratford, off of Stratford. Um, I just had the gentleman just mentioned about the time that the fuel tanks were coming, six o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock at night. Disturbing. I mean, no, there's no good time of day, but that is like the worst time of day. That's all I want to say. It's just, okay. there's no, there's Thank no you, good time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, you had a few questions. No, sure, but um, I want to try to. Uh, I, I got uh, it. This is your third time. We know who you are. This is. Um, you, you asked uh, Parker's about their tank configuration. The. Venting on the tanks is, I think, is a standard venting. You can ask them, you can find out. They're about 13 feet high. They're two-inch pipes. I don't believe they have any monitoring on them. I don't know of any gas stations in South Carolina that do that. But then I don't see many of them put outside a residential area. So the real question comes then, besides worrying about a, an underground stowage tank leaking, what type of... Uh, Controls today. I didn't hear anything about dikes or retention areas because of spills that happen out on the main area where they have a spill from fueling up their tanks. Um, about 150 different chemicals in it, but there's the, the big ones are the benzene, the toluene, the uh, ethyl benzene, and the uh, xylene is the real big actors when you have, have leaks. So, um, so they did a study in Illinois, their uh, environmental group. They put monitors on two different gas stations on their vent pipes. The vent pipes, are, they're active when they're being filled. They're active as they sit there to keep the pressure within the tank. And then you have uh, when people are fueling. And uh, they found at two different gas stations that for every 1,000 gallons that was moved, they had, in one station, 1.4 pounds of chemical vapors released from, from their tanks. At, at the other one, it was 1.7. So this, this was the beginning. These, these studies that I've cited for you guys, 2021, this isn't some old data. A lot of gas stations now, their states are starting to look at closed vent systems to protect people from being exposed. The, um, so, so as I, you can ask Parker, but I don't believe they, they have on any of their, their sites. They got beautiful gas stations, but I don't think they need to be near a, a residential area. This is, this is something out of those two, two city council meeting minutes that I asked you guys to consider going back and read, taking it back to your, your levels of when you start first seeing these zoning and planning evolutions. <coughs> the mayor, God rest her soul, made a statement I found very interesting. It's 2012. He stated, at times there's congestion on whiskey. At times there's congestion on busy roads. He said, if we think about it, however, we realize uh, we don't have a traffic problem like many other places. He stated, we have to take responsibility for our own movement of, of traffic. He says, there's several ways to get from the north to the south of Aiken without using Whiskey Road. He pointed out 
the new traffic signal system which allows one to travel down Whiskey many times without having to stop at signals. He also stated, people can schedule their time to go on Whiskey and not go during the busiest time. That type of mindset's got it. We, we got to move out of that because on the south side, that Whiskey Quarter has become worse in some cases as much as a major city like Charlotte. And there's no reason for it. I, I, I really would ask you guys to consider when you go back with your planning to look at, at that possibility of going across where the new subdivision is, mm -hmm. tying it in to the, the, the new senior apartments, going over to Citadel. And, and you know, I, we went and did this with the, with the state. They've got an economic development board that'll come in and help with infrastructure for growth. We did that with that Excel Corporation they tried to put out in front of us. It's now a defunct company. We would have had like a, you know, an empty lot out in front of us. But they were willing to go and put a signal in. We need to see about getting that pulled through on Sizemore. It would be, it would be a much improved job for you guys to be able to approve these developers that want to bring in new new jobs and Understood. activities. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're, we're going to take this up. Um, with the board, with the commission at this time. Okay. So for item 3C, do I have a motion? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, um, in regards to application 23-23002, the concept plan approval request for tax parcel number 123-11-22-001, um, I recommend that we move the city council with the listed stated conditions um, with the addition to item number seven that all parties um, to include the Aiken Powder House LLC, Drayton Properties, uh, Drayton Parker Companies, the city of Aiken, Aiken County, and South Carolina DOT, and any parties now or in the uh, immediate future uh, coordinate the improvements of the intersection of Powder House, Stratford, and Whiskey Road. Second. Okay, so there's a motion for approval and a second, um, and the motion is for uh, approval of the application as stated with the possible conditions, and then we're adding another condition, number seven, uh, to include, um, you want to read that back to me, Mario, make sure, or Jason, <laughs> make sure we have that correct. Yeah. Um, that all parties, basically in the TIA agreement, though gentlemen have stated to include the Aiken Powder House LLC um, development, Drayton Parker Companies, which is this applicant, the city of Aiken, Aiken County, and South Carolina DOT, and any parties now or in the immediate future. So if these parties were to change hands or, or operating entities, um, that they coordinate the improvements of the intersection of Powder House Road, Stratford Drive, in simple terms, that all these parties come together to improve the, the intersection. The intersection, correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to well, maybe add to that uh, as well in terms of the traffic study to include that vacant five-acre parcel to the west as a potential commercial space, have the traffic study you know, come up with some numbers for a potential uh, uh, commercial area, and then at the Lulu's, Lulu's uh, anything that could affect that intersection. So it's okay. should be part of the traffic. The motion study. was passed with the conditions listed in the seventh that was added. So you want to vote to amend the motion? You want to make a motion? Just amend the motion that the, the traffic study should include all properties that would affect that intersection. M may I add a comment? Just, just in order for her to be able, the traffic consultant to be able to do that, she would need to know a use. Now, what we have done before is to condition it as as we know what that use is that will be incorporated in. I mean, so in other words, it's continuing, it's building, and, and all that gets incorporated in as it's developed. But I'm not sure how you design it, an intersection with left turn slots, right turn slots, without knowing what all the traffic will be. You can't. You can't. You, I mean, well, if it's you, unknown. You'd have to say, well, it's five acres. It could be... 20,000 square feet of commercial could be a fast food restaurant. But at least it's better than nothing. Right now you're saying there's nothing. No traffic coming from that vacant lot. 
there should be some traffic coming from that vacant lot in in the future. But it can vary so widely, you know, wild, wildly. Right. I'd rather on have use. have that's, that's the difficulty. Hundred cars a day coming from that vacant lot than zero cars coming from the vacant lot. Well, also, as as one of the residents stated, you know, ten dollars today, a million dollars tomorrow. Uh, if you need two, a double left turn lane, you should know that now versus that. I mean, yeah, definitely. It's hard to do. I don't know how you do that. Yeah. Uh, you can make a comment. Um, go ahead. We will consider that commercial as commercial development, and out what particular commercial development. That's the problem. Yeah. That's the issue. Just, There's a hundred different uses. Come up with a medium development you got to come up with something so anything that's permitted as pc is what you want to go with i mean that's a yeah. number of various different uses there but if any, anything you select is better than zero the median average i mean that's average they could be we got to figure out a way to articulate this so they understand yeah i mean i've done it before you, you take vacant lots and you assume x x square feet or x of commercial or x Number of of homes or X number of apartments. Yeah, but if it's zone PC, I know we're going to use all the permitted uses. That can literally go from everything from a, a senior care facility to a uh, equestrian tack retail store. I understand. I mean that's five uses versus but a thousand. If, we, if you don't, you're saying that vacant piece is not generating any traffic in the future. I think that's. I mean, when I grew up on off of Powder House, there was nothing on Stratford Drive. I mean, I understand that. I get what you're saying, I, I, but I don't know how we can tell Jennifer to go do that. Yeah. Well, I, I think she can come up with come up with some numbers. Yeah. I think it's better than having zero. So yeah. It just may affect the right turn slot. It may affect the length of the right turn slot. It may affect something. That's a, that's just a difficult. I, I listen. I I've done it for a living. I understand. Okay, so how do you want to articulate? The well, I would the say that the traffic, the future traffic, the study that's being performed now, or the future traffic study of this intersection affecting, should include all properties and and trip generation, and distribution of uh, traffic coming from all properties that would affect that intersection of Whiskey Road and uh, Stratford Hall Lane. Yeah, well, we know that it's all properties, but <clears throat> do you want to say the average of everything that's in PC for that? Because just saying, hey, do a traffic study for an empty plot of land, that's the point. That I understand. Trying to make. So we, how would you like to articulate we allowed that? All, we allow it. It's an estimated um, of what could be from that. So right. I think if you were to say an average of all the other properties that exist there and then create that as the estimate of what could generate from that property, that would help in, in the planning. Right. <clears throat> at least in the future if something a higher dense comes in it's just that delta goes up a bit uh versus starting from zero i don't think it's it, it's that difficult Do you have a idea i honestly haven't seen that done before i yeah. mean i i think that you could try to I, i'm not so sure it's unusual to have some degree but Again, it's you're throwing something up against the wall a bit. You don't know for certain. Um, it's an attempt. Um, the problem is if you design an intersection with one right turn lane, one left turn lane, and then uh, something comes in. We have, it's a five-acre piece. You know something's going to be developed there. Comes in, and then you have to do something to the intersection. You know, you might not have the right of way. You may not have. I think the language could. The language could be something along the lines of um, taking that parcel into consideration. Right. I don't know how the calculations come. You know, I think the traffic study people will have to be able to work together to make a best guesstimate. Yes, of what right. may occur. That's all we I think, I think at least in the conditions oh, yeah. is what you're saying is that um, that parcel should be taken into consideration uh, for, for future. So something along those lines. I know we can't get into the details of how that exactly is sure. calculated, but. Ms. Moultrie, to your knowledge, have we done something like this uh, before? Like basically taking an empty plot of land, saying we're going to do a traffic study for an empty plot of land. I have not seen it, but I will. I will say this: at that intersection, we understand we'll be taking quite a bit. Not just simply from this 
parcel yeah. surrounding areas. So the reality is that this is probably going to be designed to the hilt anyway. I mean, seriously, but just because we know future wise. Yeah. And my, my reason for asking that question, if we've done that before, is I am hesitant to set a precedent off the cuff, right? Because if we pass this here and now, we are setting a precedent and it's off the cuff without referring back to staff, without having more deeper conversations on this. I am not against the idea of, you know, taking some average of possible builds for a undeveloped plot of land and conducting traffic studies off of that. But I am very hesitant to design language that can be used as precedent off the cuff just right here, right now. So again, I, I would happily bring this up at a later meeting and maybe set up something that's a bit more standardized, but I'm just very hesitant to set precedent off the cuff, which is my opinion on this. Another thought is to allow, at least allow, set up the language to allow our traffic, our city traffic consultant to look at that and understand if that's realistic for her to do. I mean, in other words, I, I don't feel like that's, we need to defer to her. And I would think I would leave, we can leave it open-ended to say, yes, this is maybe something she's seen before or no. Um, Pretty easy to do. You I've, know, I've but, done it but I mean, if she's, she's our traffic consultant and that's what she does for a living, yep. I think we need to defer. My background's in traffic engineering. So. so um, yeah, that's, I, I, I think we have done something similar in the past where we had a apartment complex that generated less than 100, 100 cars in the peak hour, but there was another apartment complex next to it and so we had the traffic engineer take both of them into consideration when they were looking at the on Dowdy Road. Um, you, just, you can have five developments that all generate less than 100 cars in the peak hour, but additively, they're, sure. they're sure. 450 cars in the peak hour. So I think our traffic engineer should be looking at that. Yeah, it's just a question of how to, again, to set up the, the language to where it's deferred to her and her. <coughs> Right. Um, expertise as to how that should be done, and okay. and if it realistically can be done. Okay, I'll be. So, are you going to amend the motion? Um, I think it's as long as the amendment I think is as others have stated, the traffic study includes all parcels that are that could affect that intersection to any extent that that can be done. Okay, so you want to add that to Jason's um, I would like to. amendment? Wouldn't Jason have to make that amendment since it's his? He would. He would have to approve it. Yeah. Or Pete, you can make a motion to amend the motion. <laughs> I like I like to make a motion to amend the motion that the tra the traffic study that's ongoing or and would include all properties uh, that would. Develop, that would generate traffic to affect the intersection of uh, Whiskey Road and Stratford Drive. To all extents practicable. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the motion has been amended to add the language of, of the uh, traffic study to include, if practical, other properties. So do I need to grab the vacant land beside the Hilton? Or the, the Hampton Inn too. I'm Would, I, this, 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 we could go on. Well, hold on, but do, doesn't doesn't someone need to wait? Second somebody his, needs to I'm second the motion. Yeah, sir. So we're 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 going to discuss I this. I have with to accept the, the amendment. You do have to. I'm not. You don't have to accept it. Yeah. I, I will amend the, the motion. So you're pulling your motion. Correct. Okay. So Pete, your motion is on the table, and somebody would need to second it. Okay, so this is all on YouTube, by the way. So we don't have a second. So help me on the rules. It fails. So the motion fails. Yeah. And for the record, again, I am very much open to this idea. I am just very hesitant to set precedent off the cuff. And I just think we should discuss further with staff about this um, before we set that precedent. I think it's a great idea. I just don't think that we should come up with language that can be used for legal precedent for years down the road, just off the cuff. I, I agree with you. Promise. 
these applicants are in front of us, not the other parcel, not in front of yeah. us. Can't make yeah. it that way. Yeah. I'm not comfortable. Okay, so Pete's motion fails. So you make another motion. I will resubmit my motion to approve it and send it to City Council uh, with the stated listed conditions one through six with the added item of number seven that all parties to include Powder House, Aiken Powder House LLC, Drayton Parker Companies, the City of Aiken, Aiken County, and South Carolina DOT, and any parties now or in the future, um, coordinate the improvements to the intersection of Powder House Road, Stratford Drive, and Whiskey Road. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, so the motion has been presented and second for the conditions listed with the addition of number seven as stated. Okay, any further discussion? Just, uh, just, um, <clears throat> just to state a few things. So, one, when it comes to traffic on whiskey, uh, the city of Aiken, uh, Ms. Moultrie, unless I'm mistaken, has allocated more than $100 million to do a various uh, connectors throughout whiskey in order to help alleviate traffic as our city grows. That's very slow going because obviously we have to purchase a bunch of different land and go through a whole bunch of different things, but we are keeping the growth of the city in mind by allocating those funds to add those connectors to help alleviate traffic. Um, additionally, with SCDOT itself, people mentioned adding lights. Um, SCDOT runs Whiskey Road, we don't. We, if we had the ability to add lights on Risky Road, we probably would, but we do not have that ability to do so. That is the state, not us. We can advocate for them, but we cannot mandate them. Also, the gentleman described very well from Parker's all of the DHEC regulations in regards to all of the gas. I understand that it can be a bit scary, but again, you know, we are a city government and we rely on DHEC for those things. And if they pass all of the DHEC regulations, I feel comfortable with that gas station being there. Those are all the comments that I have on this motion. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Seeing so none, the motion has been presented and seconded for approval uh, based on the conditions listed and the added conditions listed. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, like, sign, opposed. So motion carries one, five to two. Motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.